Hello, everyone. This is JVL here with my colleague from the Bulwark, A.B. Stoddard. Welcome to the dark side, A.B. Uh, real dark stuff over the weekend. Uh, we believe that proxies for Iran attacked Tower 22, which is a, um, a U.S. facility in Jordan, which sits right between, if you look at a map of Jordan, right, uh, Syria and Iraq touch with Jordan as a little triangle. And Tower 22 is like right there in the middle of that. So it's a very hot spot, obviously. Um, and this drone attack killed three American soldiers, injured another 30. It hit their barracks while they were sleeping. Um, it uh, it seems to, I mean, again, things are still developing, but what seems to have happened was that the U.S. saw the drone coming in, but it was at the same time as a U.S. drone was returning. And that's why it wasn't shot down, because they weren't sure which was which. Uh there is a whole subject here about on the military side about how the future really is like electronic and counter drone warfare. Um, there's also a foreign policy side to this. And then there's also a political side to this. Where do you want to go first? <laughs> well, I'm not an expert on how um, we've gotten to this moment uh, and how we're going to get out of it. Um, there is uh, obviously it's Biden has been hearing Republicans complain for a while now since 10 seven that this was going to happen and that they needed there needed to be, you know, serious consequences articulated to the Iranians. Um, Biden said he has. He said things, you know, like I've told them not to do anything. Um, and so they're basically running around um, and and saying that, you know, this is just not only a sign of, of Biden's weakness, but was absolutely predictable. Um, so it's a great political point for them. And um, the interesting thing is that it divides the Republican Party or the MAGA coalition or whatever it is. But it is it is really unfortunate, um, JBL, for for Joe Biden uh, for the for the threat of a wider conflict, um, both politically and in terms of our security, it's awful. Uh, so um, I don't know what he should do. That's not my area of expertise, but um, this is it's really a shit show uh, because people were warning that he wasn't basically um, being firm enough with the Iranians, and now um, he's going to have to do something to show that he is. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I would agree that this was probably inevitable, right? Because this is, we are, we are enmeshed in the region, almost inevitable that it would be through a proxy and that Iran itself would deny responsibility, which is what they've done so far. Uh, this sort of thing happens, though, all the time in the Middle East and has been happening for decades now. This is a, you know, we do this, this endless tit for tat uh, as we position and so what's likely is that Biden will respond by attacking Iranian forces or Iranian proxies, either in Syria or Iraq or Yemen, probably not Iranian territory itself. That's a step that we just don't off. I don't think we've ever taken, actually. Uh, I think the closest we've come was Reagan attacking a bunch of uh, oil, oil platforms um, that the Iranians owned. I don't think we've struck inside of yeah, maybe I'm wrong about that. It's only YouTube. Um, uh, also possible to hit Iranian ships. Uh, but here's the thing. Like, Biden has been pretty firm militarily. I mean, this is the guy who didn't back down from Putin, who, you know, has continued to escalate American aid there. Uh, and part of me wonders, like, what what is it that Republicans want, right? Like, they, they claim to say that Biden isn't, doing enough for Israel, whatever that means, right? While well, Biden has been a very staunch ally for the Israelis, which is why, in fact, Iran is trying to shake us loose by, by launching attacks. So there's this weirdness of, it's like with the immigration reform, right? You know, the, the Republicans are like, oh, the border's a mess. It's out of control. It's chaos. And then Biden's like, here, here, let's, we'll just do what you want to do. How's that sound? And they're like, oh, we can't sign that. And with, with Israel, the, the Republican position seems to be uh, Biden isn't strong enough with our partner, Bibi Netanyahu, and also Biden should not uh, be putting troops in danger in America and should be risking, you know, should be tougher with Iran, but also shouldn't start World War III. And what, 
there's no all of which is me trying. I'm sorry. I'm just filibustering here. But what I'm trying to to get across is these are not people with any governing vision. No, it's so cynical and it's such bullshit. The, the everything with Israel, uh, Joe, as they've watched him do exactly what they said um, needed to be done. That the goal is to obliterate Hamas um, and you can't back down. Uh, they can sit around and pretend that Netanyahu is a legitimate, uh, you know, partner in this, but everyone knows that he's not. Biden is doing an incredible job of dealing with that without actually prosecuting that in the media and, and, yeah. and, you know, dropping bombs on BB, which he could, and he could have his, his, um, secretary of state or, you know, advisors do, and they're not, um, they're handling it with the utmost care in the best way possible. When it comes to Iran, they're literally asking him to go to war in Iran. I mean, the problem, so that's, that's the difference here is that there's, Senator Cornyn said, target Iran. So did Lindsey Graham. And then you have um, um, Wesley Clark, who is a Democrat, uh, tweeting yesterday, the U.S. should stop saying we don't want to escalate. This invites them to attack us. Stop calling our strikes retaliation. This is reactive. Take out their capabilities and strike hard at the source, Iran. So, I completely agree with your thesis, which is that no matter what Joe Biden does, they come up with something else he's supposed to be doing, or they say they would have done a different way. We all know that Trump would not attack, would not strike Iran. And he's Mr. No Wars, right? He's a duck. Right. And we don't get into wars when Trump's involved. Immediately, Tucker tweets, this is effing lunatic. As soon as he sees tweets yesterday from these guys, because there is that tension in that coalition about whether we still lead in the world or whether we're totally isolationist, right? And they're still in disagreement with each other on that. So they're always, the MAGAs are always mad at Lindsey Graham because he feels that we need to, you know, defend the freedom of Ukraine and the sovereignty of Ukraine. And we have to counter Vladimir Putin and we have to do things that Republicans stood for like a few hours ago. And so it's total crap. But what I don't like politically is for Joe Biden to be called weak, for them to be able to tell the American public that attacks on our service people were already happening and this was inevitable and that he must do something right now <laughs> that proves right. that he has sat the Iranian regime down once and for all in an election year. And what's so frustrating to people like to us is that the people, JVL, don't follow the details of any of this. And so they're going to be told in simple terms that Joe Biden is weak. So Tom Cotton sends out a tweet and says, if you're concerned about our national security, vote for President Trump, whatever your personal politics, meaning oh. every crime that Trump has committed needs to be put aside. The fact that he'll never leave office and he tried to steal the government and, and an election needs to be put aside. Whatever your personal politics, Joe Biden has demonstrated he is too impotent and weak to keep America safe. So it's such a great punchline for them. Isn't Tom Cotton pro-Ukraine? Not when he tweets about... What, I mean, this is the weird... This is the craziest thing, right? I know. Only when he speaks to, like, AEI. Trump, Trump's whole... I mean, he is objectively... Like, I'm going to pull the plug on Ukraine day one. And a lot of these guys like Tom Cotton think that's terrible. <laughs> and at the same time, the, you know, the idea of, you know, putting Iran in its place once and for all, there's only one way to do that. And that's regime change. And right. uh, I have to believe that if Joe Biden uh, took up the goal of regime change in Iran oh. and got us into a gigantic shooting war in the Middle East, that all these people who don't want wars because they're isolationists would be very upset all of a sudden. I don't. That would don't be the end. It. Uh <laughs> Okay, moving on. Last week, jury in New York ruled on E. Jean Carroll and gave her, what, 80, $83 million? She'll, she'll never see this money, right? This is the, I, I believe it's, it's way in excess of what the, the civil guidelines are on these things. It will be negotiated down. I, I am waiting for an episode this week, hopefully, of George Conway Explains It All to Sarah Longwell, our new Bulwark podcast and YouTube product, ding, 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 <laughs> because I would like to know how people who have these judgments against them pay or don't pay. Does Fox ever cut a check 
for eight hundred million dollars or whatever it is to Dominion? Does does Alex Jones ever cut a check? Do his wages get garnished? Because I gotta feel like once you're in the millions and tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars, it's not like if you owe a thousand dollars, right? Like if you owe a thousand dollars, they will garnish your wages and people will get their money from you. I suspect it's not like this for here. But interestingly, we had Nikki Haley uh, crossing the Rubicon, everybody says, by saying that she trusts the jury verdict, which I guess is her saying that Donald Trump is guilty of defamation, which I guess is her saying that Donald Trump is guilty of sexually assault. Am I overreading that? No, it was so interesting. They um, the mag asses were jumping on Twitter to, to let us know last night that she's done for 28 or beyond because she has sided with the jury in the E. Jean Carroll case. What's so fascinating to me is watching Tim Scott, Senator Lankford, James Lankford, ask about it on the Sunday shows and they say, does that give you any pause? Give us any pause. Huh, we're at the kitchen table with good America who knows that we have peace and prosperity with Donald Trump. What's so critical is this question of whether or not you respect a jury. That's right. We've talked about that, JVL. That's going to be this whole theme throughout the year, whether or not the party is going to turn against the actual rule of law and the court system and then juries of our peers making decisions based on evidence in order to, to defend Donald Trump. So the fact that she said, I absolutely trust the jury was was really interesting. And it is I, it's, it's the end of her. Um, I'm going to keep hope alive that she's, you know, going to try to keep dinging up Donald Trump. But it, it, it was pretty interesting. As for the money, I never know. I, like you, I don't know mechanically how it works, but it is fascinating. Um, uh, and I did hear some reporting about how because it's so complicated because the Trump org is in like monitorship or something already. Right. He right. doesn't it might know be given the death penalty. Yeah, He's always lied about what he's had. And then if he can't post a bond, they get to come in and start taking stuff. So um, seizing assets. So it will be drama. I mean, it, it will get more interesting. The and repo I'm, man. I'm here for that. Yeah. No, I'm 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 with you on that. Uh, okay. We're gonna talk. We're gonna talk about Taylor Swift in a second. Um, let's do Mitch McConnell first. So you wrote about Mitch McConnell today. Tell me, tell me about Mitch McConnell and the immigration reform slash Ukraine efforts, because last week he said explicitly that he was going to kill it, I think, in a breakfast with Republicans. And then he kind of walked it back. And I guess I'm trying to understand if he's playing five dimensional chess where it's a feint with a counter feint and a double bluff or if he's really just a doddering old man or if he's really just as cynical as we all think he is and he's just trying to make sure that he's maximizing the chances of Trump winning the election. What? Tell me what's happening. Well, that that's interesting, the last one. I mean, I, I don't think he's doddering. Um, I think he knows what he's doing. He has put up, um, in keeping with his his you know, his past statements um, and support for Ukraine, he has put up quite a rhetorical fight as, uh, recently about the need to back Ukraine and to not back down from this. Um, he has also defended the immigration policy that's on the table in these negotiations, saying that they would never get anything as strong as this under President Trump, because the Democrats, as you just articulated a few minutes ago, have basically said, oh, OK, whatever you want on the border, we'll take it. They have not demanded citizenship for dreamers. They have not put anything on the, on nope. the table in exchange. It's a gimme for Republicans. And basically, um, uh, Lindsey Graham's on the record saying this. So is McConnell making the case to their colleagues. If you want real border um, reform, you will take this because you're not going to get it if, if Trump wins. We're not going to hold out for something stronger if Trump wins. So, so. McConnell both believes in the Ukraine portion and the Israeli security aid and obviously in, in the immigration. The, what was reported out last week is that he says this to his colleagues and then he backs down. And then people around him, including Langford, the chief negotiator on the Republican side, says it was misunderstood. He, he, he's not backing away. And he has people come out, and, and Romney included, and say in the next 36 hours, oh, no, 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 he's, he's on board. 
So it's very concerning because we don't know. I think he's trying to see where things go. I think he's trying to be on both sides of it. And my belief, and I even have another name for you, JBL, that didn't make it into my column because I forgot it until this morning. I think Bill Cassidy is also um, a potential vote. I see potential 12 votes or more, um, at least the, the 10 that, that they would need um, for getting this through the Senate. Now, everyone tells us that Trump has been promised by Mike Johnson, his good new speaker in the House, um, that they're not going to pass anything and Marjorie Taylor Greene won't put up with it. But there's not, there is a universe in which like Dark Brandon and other forces come up with some kind of discharge petition or something happens where you have a couple of Republicans who want to defend Ukraine and say this is absolutely defensible, a wonderful conservative border policy, and I'm going to vote with Democrats and, and, and back up these 13 Republican senators, maybe we get 17, I don't know, who, who supported this good policy. And it gets through the House over the protestations of the House Republican leadership. And they would be happy about that because they could say to Trump, we tried. Right. But they would be standing for things that they've said that they want. So that's where it is in terms of the 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 the, the politics of the deal and, and look what stage it's in. I want to see Mitch McConnell get off his ass after a whole bunch of Republican senators came out last week and said, I don't care what Trump wants. I don't care what his minions are fighting for. I don't care what what people are saying about this bill. We're going to do this because it's the right thing. And we never hear Republican senators talk that way. And we never did during the Trump administration. And the fact that they're doing it means Mitch McConnell has got to come to the mat He's got to push for this to get out of the Senate. He's got to be one of the 12 people voting for it on the Republican side. And he's got to stand up for it uh, with with Speaker Johnson and, and be on the side of a discharge petition or whatever way they can get this through. And if not, it's just deeply, deeply path- pathetic because he knows I've made the case before. I don't think he can be leader um, after this November. He has not said he's running for leader, but he's acting like he wants it. And the idea that Trump, even if Trump loses, is going to let him be leader, even minority leader, is a joke. So I, anyway, that's what I discussed in the column, that there's, there's nothing left for him to do but do the right thing. Like, he's not going to be leader, minority leader or majority leader. So I'll take the under. Whenever the question is Mitch McConnell doing the right thing or not, I'll take the under. It doesn't <laughs> even matter where you set the line. Uh, all right, last last bit. Taylor Swift is going to the Super Bowl. I was not aware that Taylor Swift was, I I should say this, before this summer, I was not aware that Taylor Swift was a fetish object for the culture war conservatives. When she made a bazillion dollars on her Eras tour, and uh, then I sort of, that came to to my knowledge. Watching people on the right especially the incels on Twitter meltdown over Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey. I mean, it is like the perfect storm, right? It's Taylor Swift who they hate. Who's this phenomenally successful, beautiful girl who is, who is dating this boy who is tall alpha football player. But then on top of it, he does public service commercials for vaccine vaccination on COVID and they've lost their ever loving minds over it. Yeah. And you are writing a piece, I'll just spoil it here, writing a piece for us on Taylor derangement syndrome, which I'm very excited to see. Uh, what is it? What is this? <laughs> no, it's awesome. There's finally something that's really kind of ha- making their brains fall out of their ears. Uh, and it's it's um, it's as you said, it's all over Twitter, Reddit, everywhere that they believe Fox did a segment on how she might be some kind of Pentagon op. Um, They believe that there's just no way that a woman who's that successful could revitalize the NFL, uh, date some, you know, nice Midwestern dude and have a wholesome relationship out in public and make, help the team, help the league, help the sport, help bring girls to watch football with their dads who were never interested in it before and the fact that she supported Biden in 2020, um, endorsed um, Marsha Blackburn's um, Senate challenger last time she ran, and is clearly a Democrat, 
uh, is, is a problem because they're terrified that she could move mountains this year if she comes out and makes a push against Trump. So that's, that is, they've been scared of that for a long time. And they use things like Time Magazine's cover of her to, and, and Trump, I think, even commented on that to sort of beat up on her and find ways to, um, to, to, to criticize her. But actually coming out and saying she's an op is evidence that um, they're really panicked. And um, they have Taylor derangement syndrome. And so that's what I'm writing about for tomorrow. They, they have their own TDS. We have ours. They have theirs. And it's going to go completely over the edge between now and the Super Bowl. So they've got like whatever it is, two weeks to just completely melt down. So I, I understand uh, getting highly annoyed by celebrities and famous people who decide that they want to assert themselves into politics. Um, yeah. Like the Barbara Streisand types, right? Who just, who won't stop talking about it, right? I don't get the sense that's what, I mean, Taylor Swift basically like stood up in a single election and said, you know, this is, I normally don't talk about politics, but this seems really important to me. And I, I think you should vote for these two people. That's, that's about the extent of it. She does not right. begin her, her her concert tours by saying, you know, no. do I see any of my proud Democrats out there? You no, know, like that. no, 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 no. She has Trumpers in the crowd. So this is going to be a very, very interesting year because we don't know how far she would be willing to go. She might not be willing to go far at all. And, but she and that's did. okay with me. Like but, I, you know, like, but he, what I guess what I'm trying to say is I, my sense, I will ask you as a woman, um, this whole thing smells like misogyny to me. Oh, like it, yeah. it seems to me that what offends them is like the the woman aspect of it more than anything else. Like I don't like I I don't understand it myself. Like getting angry at a a pop star, um, but they seem ah. to really really resent the fact that she's a woman and she's really really deft at managing her career and she's the most successful person who's ever done this at in her industry. Right. And she is, th that she is seems an to be what enrages them. Yeah. She is, she's incredibly powerful. And I did not know that until I saw the Eras movie, <laughs> the Eras tour movie. Um, I was a Swift virgin and you can't be up close to, and see what she does and see the audience reaction and not uh, appreciate that this is like a real force of nature. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it is a mix. There's probably a lot of misogyny in there, but uh, as I said, I think they are terrified that she's going to lean in. And if she did, she would move, um, she would move some numbers. So, so that is, I mean, look, she has a huge, massive following of people that will do, you know, that, that are, are moved by her, that hang on her every word. She does not run out and get attention on anything. She barely tweets you know, she, but when she does, her fans are right there, you know, thirsty for more. So um, for people who love a cult, uh, it is kind of shaking them up. But they are, you know, like I said, I think they're terrified that this is going to lead to, um, you know, some kind of late summer moment where she's with Biden or Biden's with her or something. And that um, that just... Uh, terrifies them well i i am looking forward to the next two weeks of super bowl build up where <laughs> we watch conservative brain worms on twitter as these guys decide are they for are they are they against the taylor swift team vaccination science kansas yeah. city chiefs but if you're going to be against them then you have to be in favor of like the super gay commie city san francisco's 49ers and you can't do that either. And <laughs> so which yeah. we'll just, you know, it's going to be great. All right. AB, thanks. We'll do it again next week. Thanks for being at the dark side. Good luck, America.